Again, reading in verse 1, it says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, or having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand, and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God, our sure salvation by Him alone. That's what hope is. It's not just a wish. It's a confident expectation of being saved by Christ alone. And hope maketh not a shame. That hope God gives never deceives, never leaves us disappointed. And here's why. Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. So we rejoice in trials, because through the trial, God teaches us patience, teaches us to submit to His will. And He always succeeds in teaching this. He always does. This is what brings us to say, not my will, but thy will be done. And by this, He gives us experience. We not only hear the gospel preached, we experience the grace of God in our life. And this grows us in grace and knowledge of Christ. We, we understand He's really alive, really working in our midst through this. And this works hope. This strengthens our hope. This makes us sure that we have been saved, we are being saved, and we shall be saved. And all of this is because the love of God is just fills up our heart. The love of God is shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Spirit. Now I've titled this, God's Love in Trials. God's Love in Trials. And here's what I want us to see. Through the trial, God reminds us of our sin. He makes us behold our sin. And He makes us to experience God's keeping grace. And by this... God reminds us from what He's already saved us. And He assures us that He shall save us. And this is how His love is magnified to us. In every trial, you see your sin. I see my sin in the trial. And I'm reminded of what God has already saved me from. The ruined condition. And that assures me God's keeping me now and it's going to save me in the future. And this is how His love is magnified in our hearts. Now, first of all, <clears throat> I want to show you what we were. I want to show you what God did for us, what Christ shall do for us, and the end of the trial. These four things. Now, first of all, in trials, God shows us what we were. He shows us that awful, ruined condition and what, what He saved us from. He shows us what we still are. We see the total weakness. We see Him keeping us in spite of us. And this reminds us of what we were when He called us, when He saved us. It reminds us of our sin. Verse 6. For when we were yet without strength, this is what He reminds us of right here in the trial. When we were without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Look at verse 8. But God commendeth His love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. This is what we see when we see our sin in the trial. We're reminded that when we were without strength, we're reminded that we were ungodly, we were sinners. Verse 10 says we were enemies of God. This is what we were when God came to us in the beginning. Scripture says, Psalm 14, 2 says, The Lord looked down from heaven. You know, men always talk about the Lord looking down through time and He sees us believing. The Scripture says, God looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. And what did He see? They're all gone aside. They're together become filthy. There's none that doeth good, no, not one. That's what God really saw when He looked down upon us. Nothing is more helpless than an infant. That's the most helpless thing there is, is an infant. And you want to talk about really helpless, 
an infant cast out into a field and abandoned. That's what Scripture describes of us. He said, As for thy nativity in the day that thou was born, thy navel was not cut, neither was thou washed in water to supple thee. Thou was not salted at all, you were not swaddled at all. None I pitied thee to do any of these unto thee, to have compassion on thee. But thou was cast out into the open field to the loathing of thy person in the day you were born. And when I passed by, oh, aren't you thankful he passed by? When I passed by, he said, I saw thee polluted in your own blood. And I said unto thee, when thou was in thy blood, live. Yea, I said unto thee, when thou was in thy blood, live. That's how, we, that's how we were given spiritual life. God spoke it. That's that incorruptible seed whereby the gospel is preached unto you and Christ speaks, live, and you live. When He speaks, you live. And He said, I spread my skirt over thee and I covered thy nakedness. That's His righteousness. And I entered into a covenant with thee. I swear unto thee and I entered into a covenant with thee, saith the Lord thy God, and you became mine. That's what He did for you and me. When we were yet without strength, when we were the infant cast out into the field, unable to do one thing for ourselves, dead in sins. He describes us here as ungodly. That means we were everything God is not. God's just. And through Adam's transgression, we were unjust. Before the unyielding law of God, unjust. God is righteous. We were unrighteous. Not able to fulfill God's law. Guilty sinners. We were unholy. God's holy. We were unholy. That means our inner man was corrupt. We were corrupt through and through. Guilty before the law and corrupt inwardly. That's to be without strength. That's to be ungodly. And in our minds, we were enemies. God's God was an enemy to us in our minds. God always viewed His people in Christ. And He was always from the beginning determined to show us mercy and grace. But in our minds, God was our enemy. And we hated God. Scripture says the carnal mind is enmity against God. That means hatred against God. That's what every unregenerate heart is. is enmity against against God. That's hatred against God. It's not subject to the Word of God, and neither indeed can be. Paul said these things are spiritually discerned, and so a natural man, he can't understand these things. He can't enter into these things. They're spiritually discerned. God has to give us a new heart, a new nature, a new mind, the mind of Christ to behold what He's done for us. God says we were alienated and enemies in our minds by wicked works. And those wicked works, you know what we called those works? We called those works good works. We called them righteousness. We called it that by which we were going to make God receive us. All our benevolent deeds. God said they were wicked works and they were the very thing that made God our enemy in our minds. Because we didn't want to let go of those things. We didn't want to give up those things. And when we heard we're going to have to give up our works, that made us consider God our enemy. Enemies in our minds by wicked works. And God sends the trial to do for us now what He did for us in that first hour. He sends the trial to show us in our flesh this is still what we are. Right here. This is still what we are in our flesh. And He sends that trial to show you that He has to keep you. He has to keep you. And it's to keep us from looking to ourselves. It's to keep us from looking at us and thinking we can stand on our own and we don't need God. Remember when Paul talked about that trial that came to him in Asia? He said we were pressed down above measure so that we despaired even of life. We couldn't even, 
We had no hope in ourselves, in our flesh, in our strength. We despaired. We thought we were going to die. And that's what he sends the trial for. However much pressure it need, you need to make you despair and make you feel like you're going to perish, that you can't, to show you you can't do anything, that's the pressure he'll give you. And what's the purpose of it? Paul said, we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves. That's the purpose. So that we do not trust in ourselves, but we trust in God which raiseth the dead. So that's the first purpose. Remind us of what we were so that we're reminded of what we still are. To keep us from looking to us, keep us looking to Him. Now that's a good reason to have a trial, isn't it? That makes you appreciate the trial, doesn't it? <coughs> Here's the second thing. When God's used that trial to bring us to the end of ourselves, then God saves us from that trial. He brings us out of it and makes us see He brought us out of it. And this reminds us how He saved us in that first hour. All over again, we're reminded of what He's done for us up to this point right now. And when you're reminded of that, you see His mighty grace towards you. Look here. In Romans 5 and verse 6, look at it again. We emphasize a different word this time. When we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died. Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man one will die. You take a self-righteous, pious man, you might find one or two that will die for him. Yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. You take a man who's he's benevolent, he's a good man. There'd be a, maybe a few more die for him. He's a little more tolerable. But you take a sinner, you take a vagrant that's filthy and nasty and can't benefit anybody whatsoever, nobody's going to die for him. And that's who we were. And look, but God commendeth His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Isn't God's love amazing? God's love's amazing because not even our fallen Adam changed God's love for His people. Our fall didn't alter God's love for His people not one bit. Why? Because God does not love His children because of something in us. It's not something in us that causes God to love us. God loves His people freely by His grace. Freely by His grace. And it's for that cause that He sent His Son to die. It's for that cause that Christ laid down His life. Because He loved us. Before as yet we knew Him. When as yet we were these helpless, ungodly enemies. He loved us. He commended His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us because He loved us freely. He said in Hosea 14, 4, I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely. He said in Romans 3, 24, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. This is free grace. No cause in us. No cause in us. And when He reveals to you, to His child, when He comes in the Spirit and He reveals to you what you are and what a sinner you are and just a, a wavering, changing, unsteady sinner that you are, the best news you can ever hear is that God loved you without a cause in you. That's the best news you can ever hear. You hated to hear the message that said He saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to His own purpose and grace which was given us in Christ before the world was made. We hated that message. We hated to hear that. Because by our wicked works, that made God our enemy. We hated to hear that it was not by works of righteousness we had done, but according to His mercy, He washed us in regeneration. 
and was abundant toward us in grace because of the work of Christ in His blood. We hated that message before, but when He's revealed to you what a sinner you are, that becomes the best news you could ever hear because since He did not love us for anything in us, nothing in us is going to change His love for us. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Yea, I've loved thee with an everlasting love, He said. Everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. Therefore, because I loved you from everlasting to everlasting, when you fell in Adam, it didn't change. I still drew you to me because I loved you. He said it's of the Lord's mercies that we're not consumed because His mercy fails not. His compassions fail not. He said, I'm God and I change not. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. Therefore, you sinful, tricky, conniving sons of Jacob are not consumed because my, because I, because I don't change. I don't change. Why was it necessary God send His Son for us? Because He's just and we were guilty. He's just and we were guilty. God reserves mercy for thousands, but He by no means clears the guilty. And the only way that we could be justified is to die. It's the only way. There was no other way. And in amazing love, God sent His Son to take our place. To bear our transgressions, to bear our curse, to take our place and die our death for us. That ought to cause us to pause and to really think about the condes condescension. How far down God was willing to come to save His people. Talk about saving us to the uttermost. That's the uttermost. The suffering He endured. The shame of the cross that the Scripture says He despised. And by His blood, He justified all for whom He died. He justified all His people. And, and this was when we, were, when we were without strength, when we were ungodly, when we were enemies in our minds. He did this for us before we ever even knew Him. And once a guilty man's died, the law can't say anything to him then. And because his people died in him, the law has nothing else to say to us. The law wasn't made for a righteous man. And we're righteous men in Christ. The law can't say anything else to you. You've died in him, and you fulfilled the law perfectly in him. And he did this for us when we were enemies. You know, he tells us to love our enemies. We, we really should have a heart to love our enemies when we consider how he loved us when we were enemies. Shouldn't we? He told Israel, he said, you be kind to the stranger. Because you don't forget, you were strangers in Egypt. We were strangers, weren't we? Cast out aliens, and yet he loved us. That ought to make us really, really love our enemies. Be merciful to them. Thirdly, this is what shall happen to us. Now, we've seen what we were. We've seen what God did for us. This, was, this reminds us, the trial reminds us of what God did for us when we were in that condition. And so, we see what He shall do for us. If we know what He did for us when we were dead in sin... Then he says, look, verse 9, Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. <laughs> if it was by his death that he did this for us when we were enemies, then now that we're reconciled friends, we'll certainly be saved by his life. And this is what he shows you in that trial. He sends that trial and he shows you 
God will not pour out justice on you a second time. He's already done it in Christ. And He's not going to lose you. He's not going to pour out judgment on you. This is the love of God that we see in the trial. This is why He sent the Holy Spirit in the first place and gave us life and gave us faith in Christ. Because He would not let us go. Christ had justified us and He would not let us perish. Justice demanded we'd be saved. We'd be called out and given faith in Christ. And this is the reason He keeps us by the power of God. You've heard it said, God stands to lose more than we do if He loses one for whom Christ died. Because His glory is at stake. His justice is at stake. His, his very character is at stake if He were to lose one. Because justice has been satisfied, meaning He must call us and keep us and bring us to glory. Everyone for whom Christ died. It's not our works, it's not our faith, it's not our obedience after we're called. It's God keeping us by His love and by His grace. That's how we're saved. Our acceptance, our only acceptance with God is Christ. And for His sake, He will keep us and continue to save us until the end. And every trial that we face is reminding us nothing, absolutely nothing, shall be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ. Nothing. And that's where the love of God is. The love of God's not outside of Christ. That ark pictured Christ. The love of God was in that ark. That's why He put His people in that ark. The love of God wasn't outside. He wasn't outside where the rain was falling and where the flood destroyed those outside. That wasn't where His love was. His love was in that ark. And His love is not outside of Christ. His love's in Christ where He put all His elect from the foundation of the world. And because that love never changes, there's absolutely nothing. Life, death, things to come, nothing that can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. And that's what He's going to teach us in the trial. Isn't that good news? That's... that's that makes the trial worth it, doesn't it? When you face that trial and it's hard and, and we don't enjoy the trial while it's happening. We don't. But here's the end. This is what he brings us to. When that love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, at the end of that trial, I've experienced this happen. I experienced it in the first hour he called me. And I've experienced it a little bit in some small trials, but every now and then he'll give you a, a good, nice, heavy trial. And in 2003, Melinda and I just, when we thought we was as low as we could go, we found out we wasn't as low as we could go yet. And it was just one after another, one after another, one after another. But when he, he broke me, and I don't mean only financially, I mean... In my heart, he broke me. And that's when all of a sudden I realized he's done all this because he loved me. You remember the story I told you about Brother Walter Groover? They had adopted a little girl and Walter thought he, he would try to be a little nicer to this little girl, not, not spank her or anything, and that would make her think he loved her, you know, because she was adopted. And he would discipline his other children, but he wouldn't discipline her. And one day she did something, and she kept acting up. She just kept acting up, kept acting up. Finally, he, he took her and spanked her. And she just, she was crying, and she just turned to him and was so happy. And she hugged him, and she said, now I know you love me. That's what he does for you when he gives you this trial. He makes you know he loves you. Whom he loves, he chastens. Whom a father loves, he chastens. And God does it for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness. Keep us looking to Christ only. And so when he brings that love and sheds that love in your heart, we thank God for increasing our hope. This is at the end of the trial. We thank him for increasing our hope. We thank Him for growing us in grace by experience to make us experience His grace. We thank Him for 
given us patience to submit to His will. He, he makes it in the trial to where you can't do anything else but just wait on God to work His will. And He makes us thank Him for that. And we even thank God for the trial. We even thank Him for the trial. I, I know some folks, believers, who lost their mother to cancer. And I've heard every one of those children say they wouldn't change it at all. Because God did all these things for them through it. They thank God even for the trial. What the psalmist say? It's good for me that I've been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. We even thank Him for the trial. But here's what we thank Him for most of all. Look down at verse 11. And not only so, but we also joy in God Himself through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we've now received the atonement. He brings us to rejoice, not just in the grace, not just in the hope, not just in the experience or the trial. He brings you to rejoice in God Himself. There's a living union there between you and God, and He makes you know it. And He brings you to His breast and hugs you close and lets you know you're safe. He's not going to let you go. So next time, brethren, you come into a trial and things are tough and it's hard and, and, and you, you weight it down, just remember, God's not doing it to destroy His child. He's not doing it to punish His child. He already punished us in Christ. He's doing it because He loves us. And He's doing it to remind us of all these things that He has done for us, that He is doing for us, and that He shall do for us. He has saved me, He is saving me, and He shall save me. And that will make you thankful for God. Alright, let's stand together. God, our Father, we so thank You for dealing with us as children, for dealing with us in a merciful and kind way, chastening us when we need it. Lord, strengthen us in the trial and make us truly submit and not, not be murmuring and complaining, but rejoice in what You've done. And Lord, we're thankful that's the end to which you bring us. We're so weak and we're so feeble and we know so little. And we're so sinful. But Lord, we thank you for this grace, this wonderful work that you continue to do for us to ever keep us mindful of what we are, what we were, what you have done, what you are doing and shall do. We're thankful for that. Keep us looking to Christ only. Lord, we pray you'd meet with us today and teach us that once again. Make us rejoice in Christ Himself. Lord, forgive us our sin. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.